All right, this is it, the moment you've been waiting for, when a middle-aged white guy will explain feminism to you. Uh, I don't think I'm mansplaining here, because I don't imagine my target audience is somebody who has deep expertise in feminism. Uh, uh, I hope you will learn something from this. The, the focus of this lecture is not on the broader political philosophy or social philosophy or movement of feminism, but specifically the application of feminism to literary theory and criticism. That said, pictured here on our first page is Kate Millett, the author of Sexual Politics, an extraordinary and groundbreaking work of uh, feminist thought that influenced both uh, legal theory and philosophy, as well as literary criticism and cultural studies and the representation of women in our culture. So what is feminism, broadly speaking? Well, it is the uh, be belief in the social, political, and economic equality of the sexes. I uh, subscribe to this philosophy. I try to be a feminist. Uh, and putting it into practice, believing something and putting it into practice can be different things, but you know, we're, we're all doing our best. Um, but this belief is not something that is shared by everyone and, and people differ for it for a number of different reasons. Um, and I'm not interested in debating it here right now, but I am interested in, in talking about feminist Literary criticism. Uh, literary criticism uh, can be defined by either its goals or its methods. Uh, and Marxism, for example, Marxist literary critics are interested in looking at cultural products in terms for what they reveal about the class structure of our society. Um, psychoanalytical criticisms are interested in looking at what it reveals about the structure of the human mind and, and the structure of our motivations, our deep impulses. Uh, and so you can look you can look at some forms of literary criticism as being more aligned with their goals and some as more aligned with their methods. Uh, new criticism, for example, and reader response are more about method than goal. Um, feminism is uh, not something that is defined by a single method. Feminist critics will make use of close reading of psychoanalysis, of structuralist analysis, of deconstruction, and of historicist, Marxist, and contextualist types of criticism. So the feminist critic will look at the status of the decoder, the, the writer, the reader, the reference, and the signal, all of them. Um, and they do so with respect to a, a series of goals that most feminist critics share. The first of these and I, I get this phrase from Robert Dale Parker's How to Interpret Literature, is taking women seriously and respectfully. Uh, and so that is the overall thing that all feminists share, no matter their approach, no matter their specific differences. Um, there are within feminism debates over essentialism. Uh, and if you remember from deconstruction, we talked about anti-foundationalism and anti-essentialism. Uh, essentialism is the belief that womanhood and manhood have a deep, uh, like a unchanging, trans-historical nature, an essence, so to speak. Um, and there are those who say that no, gender identity and masculinity and feminine, femininity are produced within language and within culture. And this is a debate um, among feminists uh, and has been for many decades, uh, in fact. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir w um, articulated in The Second Sex the um, prof uh, very profound ar articulation of the anti-essentialist statement when she said that woman is made and not born, talking about how um, language and culture produces the ca and law and the economy produce the category of women. The way that we divide work produces the category of woman um, as opposed to uh, chromosomes and body parts. Um, and this has been, I think, the, the view among the majority of feminists since Simone de Beauvoir, but there have been dissenters, um, up to and including those who call themselves trans-exclusive radical feminists today, although many will say that they are not radical feminists, and that, that is a debate I'm not going to get into here. Um, but uh, one of the things that all 
uh, feminists do is re-examine reflexive or naturalized assumptions about gender roles. And naturaliz naturalization is an idea that we learned about in Marxism, uh, where something which is culturally produced or, or linguistically produced, historically contingent, is taken as being part of nature. And one of the works of literary theory and critical theory is to try to find and identify those beliefs, those attitudes, those opinions, those reflexive assumptions that we think, well, that's just nature, and, and say, no, actually, that's culture, that's accidental, that is produced by history and by existing power relations. And this is one of the things that feminism does, specifically with the relationships between men and women and in the construction of gender and how that positions people in society. More specifically, uh, within literary studies, feminists have focused on fashioning a more inclusive canon, not automatically discounting and excluding the work of women just because it's by women, which was done for pretty much most of uh, Western history, most of human history. Um, the feminists also seek to reevaluate literature and other cultural artifacts to decenter the male experience as default and men as the regular kind of person, and overall to challenge patriarchy. This is a key term in feminism, so let's have a look at patriarchy. What does patriarchy mean? Patriarch patriarchy is, and this is Robert Dale Parker talking again, the broader cultural history and practice of centering on men while underestimating women. It's not just a matter of hating women, but it's a matter of not taking women seriously. This is a form of misogyny that is in some ways more insidious than hating women, because patriarchy can present itself as benevolent, as caretaking, um, in a way that, in fact, infantilizes women and reduces their agency. Oops, I went ahead. Um, patriarchy is also, and this is Merriam-Webster, a social organization marked by the supremacy of the father in the clan or family, the legal dependence of wives and children, and the reckoning of descent and inheritance in the male line, broadly controlled by men of a disproportionately large share of power. And you could say, oh good, we got rid of patriarchy. Except, you know, if you look at the upper echelons of most organizations, including my university, um, they're mostly men, still. The upper echelons of banks, the military, etc. I mean, our, our world is still mostly controlled by men. Um, it's just a fact. If you if you if you look at it, there are some very visible women in power, but um, they are they are exceptions, and they are often their womanhood is marked and and remarkable and commented on, and a problem that needs to be addressed often in a way that it isn't for men. So patriarchy has these two meanings. One is a very is a more anthropological kind of preset, precise technical meaning about how society is organized. And then it has another meaning that often gets used, which is the broader cultural history and practice of centering on men while underestimating women. And these two reinforce each other, right? Um, so some of the interests of feminist criticism are representation, and I've got a few representations of, of female anti-heroes, uh, as it were, uh, from the last decade or two. Um, feminist criticisms look at how women get represented, and this is something that I think a lot of younger uh, students and readers and English majors are familiar with, right? There is on online, there are a lot of debates about representation. And, you know, the famous phrase from Stuart Hall, the, the Marxist cultural studies uh, scholar, representation matters, uh, which he formulated, I think, in the 1970s, is, is now sort of a kind of a generally understood and um, uh, almost obsessed on kind of concept. So feminist criticism looks at how, at images of women, how they're portrayed, um, the, one of the other things that feminist criticism uh, debates is the concept of prescriptive realism. And this is about, the, you know, this sort of relates to the idea of quote unquote good representation versus bad representation. Uh, and, and to what extent do authors have the responsibility to uh, create women who are sympathetic? Or, on the other hand, um, is it in fact more feminist to go beyond just celebrating and empowering women and representing women like Cersei Lannister and, and what's her face from uh, Gone Girl and so on and uh, Killing Eve and, and Greenleaf as as full, complete characters capable of their own uh, uh, moral choices, agency, uh, mistakes, you know, um, 
to, to what extent do, are, are you know authors responsible for p- portraying women in a good light? And at, and at what point is that no longer an imperative, but is, is the imperative of representation more to uh, give a rich, full, and inc- complete depiction of women? In either case, whether it's, it's uh, p- portraying women as good or women as, as complicated and, and uh, you know, different from each other, either way, it, um, all feminist representation of women will represent women as agents in their own right as people with stories of their own, and not merely as obstacles or prizes or problems for men. Um, another interest of feminist criticism is, re-evalu- is the recovery and reevaluation of literature by women and criticism by women. I myself am a scholar of medieval and early modern literature, and the early modern period in particular is one where in recent decades a lot of authors who were considered as minor authors, like Margaret Cavendish and Mary Roth and Afra Bain, who were um, whose reputations critically, uh, even though they, they achieved some success in the 17th and 18th century, were um, dismissed as being lightweight, unimportant authors, um, kind of curiosities or, or frivolous interests by male critics in the 18th and 19th century were reevaluated by feminist critics in the later 20th century and early 21st century. Um, another interest of criticism increasingly is uh, the debate between an intersectional feminism that sees differences in identity identity categories within women versus identifying feminism with the interests of white Western bourgeois women. Uh, so this is a particularly a topic of interest to what's called the third wave, which we'll get to that. Actually, let's get to that right now. You may have heard in the discourse, TMTM, uh, uh, discussion of waves of feminism. And if you're not sure what that means, I'm going to briefly go over that uh, so, that, so that you understand. And, and are is this a useful concept? Well, I'm not sure if it is, this idea of waves of feminism, but it's one that's everywhere. So if you encounter it, you should understand what people mean by it. The first wave of feminism refers to the 19th, actually it really goes back to the 18th century with Mary Wollstonecraft. The, first, the 18th century through the early 20th century Um, and really peaks in the turn of the 20th century in Europe and North America. It's defined in the United States by figures such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who struggled for the right to vote, which is called suffrage, for to legal personhood and to access to higher education. Now, um, there's been revisionary history that has demonstrated that some of these women were pretty racist and they were arguing that how is it that black men can vote when white women can't? Um, and this is in, you know, this is just symptomatic of the way that oppressed groups can be pitted against each other by in the interlocking systems of oppression in our culture. But um, th- so this was the first wave of feminism and it kind of culminates in suffrage, um, the, the right of women to vote. Um, and, the, and access for upper class women specifically to universities. And um, also in the First and Second World War, the entrance of women into the workforce, which was motivated by necessity as much as anything. England, for example, um, had women working in munitions factories because all of their men were at the front. And it was a similar situation in the United States and Canada in World War II, where all these women were, were working in factories and doing all these jobs that men had formerly done. And they seemed to be doing okay at it. And then when all the men came home, there was uh, a kind of reactionary movement that wanted to restore an imaginary former gendered order where women would be in their domestic space and, and relieved from having to do men's work. But a lot of women were not really content with this, having uh, uh, experienced a different kind of life. And so um, we get uh, the second wave of feminism in the, from the late 1950s, uh, which we can kind of see as going to the 1980s, um, which involved, for one thing, a renewed fight for legal personhood, full participation in the public, public sphere, attention to cultural as well as legal repression of women's ability to speak, write, 
work and even exist in the public sphere, a critique of masculinist Western culture. It's not merely a legal battle anymore, but it's also a cultural battle against, against the norm, the social norms that enforced patriarchy. For example, in like as, as late as 1970, there were many restaurants that where a woman wouldn't be seated if she had pants on, right? The, the codes of gendered performance were, were heavily policed. Um, and this is one of the things that feminists fought against. Um, and now, dress reform, interestingly, had always been a part of feminism going back to the 19th century when uh, the, for one of the things that the first wave of feminists fought against was the restrictive, torturous dress of 19th century women. Um, now, I know trad wives might be into all that, but there's no reason they need to parade their lifestyle choices in front of us decent folk. Right. Um, Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, Catherine McKinnon, Andrea Dworkin, um, these were a number of important uh, political and philosophical thinkers in the second wave of feminism. Um, some of them are problematic in their own rights, but they're all powerful intellects and all really significant people who changed our world and are worth learning more about. But I got to keep going because we're talking about literary criticism here and not feminism in general, which I'm not the best qualified person to talk about. So let's talk about literary and cultural critics. The, our, some of the key figures are Mary Ellman, Kate Millett, Jermaine Greer, and Elaine Showalter. Um, Kate Millett and Elaine Showalter, I think, especially are, are super uh, interesting figures. Um, I want to just contextualize this uh, um, discussion of the first and second wave in um, the legal developments for women in the 20th century United States. Um, in, the in 1920, <clears throat> women's suffrage is ratified. Flat fast forward to 1960, when the FDA approves birth control pills, which is absolutely transforms uh, um, the, 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 the relative freedom of women uh, in society when they can ha you know, have sex and not get pregnant. Um, uh, 1963, John F. Kennedy passes the Equal Pay Act, which is not applicable to salespeople, executives, and administrators until 1972. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act bans employment discrimination on the basis of sex. In 1966, the National Organization of Women is founded. In 1969, in a case called Bow v. Colgate-Palmolive, women may not restrict physical labor to men. Um, Schultz versus Wheaton, companies can't change a job title to pay women less. 1972 was the passage of Title IX, which you may have heard of in relation to sexual violence on campus, but Title IX was actually passed. Uh, its overall goal was to make sure that uh, women and men were funded equally in education and that the resources afforded to education, both in the K-12 level and the university level, was not hoarded for men. And that included sports and it included the safety of women on campus, which is where it uh, uh, goes over to issues of safety and security for women on campus. Uh, 1973, of course, was the passage of Roe versus Wade, recently repealed. Um, and 1974 was the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. My mother, who was born in 1941, um, wasn't able to get a credit card in the 1960s or a car loan without my father signing for it. Women were, up until 1974, and even a little bit after, basically speaking, um, not fully legal persons. They could not engage in all contracts and all business deals and all kind of work in their own right. To, to participate in the public sphere required uh, an escort to some extent or another by a man. By the way, a number of these cases, Schultz Wheaton, um, Equal Credit Opportunity, the Pred Pregnancy Discrimination Act, were, um, pros were prosecuted uh, by an attorney named uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg before she was famous for uh, being on the Supreme Court. Uh, in 1980, uh, sexual harassment was defined by the Equal Opportunity Commission. Uh, that people never really talked about it before. I, I, you know, my, I ta remember talking with my mother about sexual harassment when she worked as a secretary on Wall Street in the 1960s, and she said there was no word for sexual harassment because it was just everywhere. It was just how people were expected to interact. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's... it's uh, some people could deal with that, right? Some people could have the, develop the kind of st uh, the tough skin, the, the, the strategies in order to be able to negotiate an, uh, an environment when they were constantly 
under a low-level assault by everyone around them. Um, but that doesn't mean just because some people can handle it that it was morally acceptable. And uh, and we continue as as you know the Me Too movement uh, of a few years ago. We continue to move past that world, but not without a great deal of struggle. The the goals that were fought for by the second wave of feminism are still being fought for. We're still fighting for legal equality. Um, we're still fighting for uh, cultural equality. Um, in the realm of literary criticism, uh, Gil Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar's The Mad Woman in the A Attic was a major landmark which described a male-centered literature that represents women in the 19th century as monsters or angels. Um, this is one example of, of, of the, the, the way that um, literature, canonical literature, gets revived, revised uh, and reanalyzed uh, according to values that do not dismiss women as being less than human. Um, another thing that develops in the 70s is what's called French feminism, although I think maybe in France they just call it feminism, I don't know. But French feminism, uh, you know, represented by such figures as Luce Erigeray, ah, Julia Kristeva, Hélène Sissou, and Monique Wittig, who is Québécois actually, um, brought, frequently brought a psychoanalytic perspective to the anxieties and suffering of women in patriarchal culture and uses the tools of psychoanalysis to analyze patriarchy, which is a little bit turning the tables since Freud was really sexist and said things like anatomy is destiny and believed that, you know, women's sexuality was basically masochistic and that um, normative psychosocial development involved w women accepting that their place of submission in society. Um, so Freud, uh, so these women are, took the, the tools of psychoanalysis and kind of turned them against their creator to uh, argue that um, uh, men, that patriarchy is actually a, an expression of men's in, uh, sense of bodily inadequacy and dependency on women from whom, after all, all men derive their life. Third wave. Okay, this is something people argue about a lot. When did the third wave stop, start? When did it end? Did it ever end? I don't have an answer to these questions, so I'm gonna I'm, I put it in quotation marks and say that the third wave goes roughly from the 1990s to did it end? Are we in a fourth wave? I don't know. I do know that the overall goal we can say of third wave feminism is to complicate the theories of second wave feminism and make it more contemporary, relevant to contemporary culture. There was in the 1980s a sort of exhaustion with um, the traditional image of feminism as being kind of joyless and like scoldy, which is, you know, a, a criticism that was itself sexist. Um, that went hand in hand with a backlash against feminism that went also with a sense as more and more white women especially entered the corporate world and became property owners and were more visible in positions of leadership. Um, the sense that second wave feminism had achieved its goals and yet there was still, um, you know, sexism around. So uh, there was more nuanced thinking as well about differences among women. But for example, does feminism as such, represent, which represents the suburban wives in the USA, also represent 15-year-old girls in Uganda? Does it represent old ladies in China or Palestine? Um, there's a more nuanced consideration of the effects of patriarchy on men. Interesting work in these rights, both by uh, Barbara Ehrenreich and Susan Faludi. Uh, Susan Foody is also the author of a great uh, book called Backlash, which describes the, the, you know, we've gone through many ways. Every time there's a wave of feminism, there is a wave of backlash as well. Uh, and Susan Faludi uh, anatomizes the backlash of the 1980s in a book called Backlash. Great, great writer, great thinker. Um, uh, with the third wave, there's also an interest in building coalitions and creating possibilities for a plurality of gendered identities and life roles so that feminism becomes a broader and more inclusive uh, category. The term intersectionality, which um, views the inter how different kinds of minoritized identities intersect with womanhood, was developed by Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a legal scholar studying the um, the 
differences in the credibility of testimony, for example, between black women and black men, and that black men were more believed than black women. So um, to be a black woman was both to be a black a person and a woman, and that there was a kind of um, sum of these identities that was greater or, or, or more stigmatized in terms of a reduction in credibility than just the addition of these two identities. This is the idea of intersectionality, which has been much abused by um, its critics, in my opinion. But this is not about my opinion, so I'm just trying to teach you here uh, so that uh, you can make up your own mind. Um, third wave feminism tended to take a more strong commitment to anti-essentialism. That is the idea that uh, feminism is not based in uh, a, a kind of ontological, universal natural concept of womanhood. There were second wave feminists who were both French feminists and North American UK feminists who were committed to the idea of womanhood as a kind of essence that um, had the power to redeem and transform the world, that the men folk had had their chance and now it was the time for the women to take over. And this is kind of one of the sort of stereotypical ideas about feminism of that period. Um, you know, the idea of women going and living on a lesbian collective and like cultivating their, their womanly essence in order to like, you know, create a new way, a utopia. It's kind of a utopian idea. Um, third wave feminism is not utopian and it is not essentialism. It does not believe in this idea, some kind of um, elevated or mythologized idea of womanhood as, as the uh, based on biological uh, uh, f embodied femaleness as the kind of answer to these things, but is rather sees womanhood as constructed in language, in culture, under the influence of deconstruction, Marxism, the newly emergent queer theory, which we'll talk about in the next video, and new historicism. Um, and so there, there's this development is, uh, of a distinction between sex and gender uh, starts to develop. Um, uh, two major scholars in third in third wave feminism, um, of course, are one of my absolute favorites, Gail Rubin, whose whose uh, work, the Traffic in Woman, which com uh, the Traffic in Women, which does a Marxist analysis of the role of women uh, in society, is is absolutely brilliant. Um, and also Judith Butler, who um, sort of explodes the idea of, of womanhood in in, in a sense. Um, by exploring how gender is constructed and also, weirdly enough, deconstructs the, um, heavily influenced by deconstruction, uh, kind of deconstructs the binary of sex and gender and talks about how what, is suppo what, what are supposedly biological realities are also, also have their foundation in discourse. Um, really fascinating stuff, which I am only scratching the surface of right here. Um, is there a fourth wave of feminism? I've got, I have here a cartoon from the 2010, from, from, uh, a website, which about 10 years ago was ubiquitous and that's everyday feminism. Since 2010, there has been a more widespread discourse, activism and media directed protest with respect to bodily autonomy, sexual harassment, body shaming, rape culture, and what I would call discourse in interaction, including mans mansplaining, microaggression, body shaming, cat calling, uh, a kind of, and there's a kind of utopian, um, I think, sense in all these of, of trying to transform a culture into one that is less sexist and more hospitable and welcoming and safe for everyone. There obviously, as you might know, has been a, uh, another wave of reaction against uh, third, fourth wave. I don't know if the fourth wave really is, is, is just, I feel like sometimes I feel like the fourth wave is just the third wave plus the internet. I don't know. But I, I think that, you know, we have also seen in the last five to 10 years with the rise of the manosphere and red pill and all that garbage, um, uh, a, a, a wave of reaction against the, uh, this kind of feminism. Um, in any case, this feminism is one that has been keenly aware of or maybe I think overly <laughs> interested in representation, in cultural products, in books, in movies, in TV, uh, to the extent that sometimes it's been maybe been accused of sort of ignoring the material reality of, of women in favor of uh, sim symbolic uh, um, uh, acts. I don't know, um, but I do hope that this has 
brought you up to speed on what people are talking about when they talk about feminism in relationship to criticism and the different waves of criticism uh, of feminism and how they informed types of feminist criticism. Uh, again, this is just scratching the surface. This video is meant for beginners, not for those who uh, are, you know, well versed in feminist thought already. So if you've listened this far, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your patience, and I welcome any thoughts or comments that you might have. I look forward to talking with you about this. Have a great day. Bye.